met a gypsy. Nick so. Doan is uh, in the studio for Gypsy Tales podcast, mate. Appreciate you coming in. Yeah, pleasure. I thought um, let's start at Cockroach Court. Cockroach Court. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, um, I needed a place to live. I guess that was really the, uh, the the start of that. There was a few others. My brother was living in a house. It was a development that went bad. I think in the eighties. Yeah went bad i think they went whoever had it went uh, went bankrupt and, and the, the development sort of sat idle so there was a bunch of um there was a few homes and a couple of apartments which just there was nobody uh residing in them so a few of the few of the locals decided they should reside in them really <laughs> so it was just a squattersville basically no way and then um so so i got on the I, I got on the wagon as well and, and utilised uh, one, I think it was this two-level apartment building and um, the front in the front half had electricity, the back half didn't have electricity. That's insane. <laughs> but, but nobody was paying for the, well, somebody was paying for the electricity. We certainly weren't. But, um, but yeah, that was, um, that was pretty much the end of 88, the beginning of 89 before I scooted off to... Um, um, scooted off to Europe to race for, for Honda, Rothmans Honda and um, um, yeah it was right on the beach there at, at Miami yeah. it was it was perfect so it was uh, <laughs> it was all good a lot of a few of the guys and including my brother my eldest brother stayed there for probably about another two years after that really you know, before they were asked to move on but I think they didn't mind whoever actually had uh, took a hold of the property actually didn't mind because everyone was looking after the properties it wasn't like it was yeah. derelict and people burning floorboards and you know, you know it was actually people <laughs> making it their home so yeah other than um, as i said i don't know who was paying for all the utilities but i mean again they didn't mind because people were looking after it oh so that's last my night, take on it anyway <laughs> <laughs> so last night i was watching uh, an old wild world of sports uh piece that you did and it was around then like that you actually did like a walkthrough um of the place and that must have been just like a, a crazy time in your life because it was if you go from from there like that 88 89 and then the the years that followed i mean 92 was when you had your accident and then you were winning a bunch of races that year and probably going to win the title so like it's a very condensed uh I guess period of time from being yeah like living in this place in Miami to kind of taking on the world totally do you look back at at that time as because I mean I think about this in the I guess in the position that I was in the last couple of years it's like you kind of just go from like literally nothing and then there's like this kind of steep climb that you take uh, but there's all this transitional period where you're still kind of broke, but things are doing well. And, uh, and I, I, I sort of look at it now and feel like maybe I'm on the tail end of that. And I look back at it as like, ah, oh, it's a pretty dope way to live, you know? Like you've got all this potential that you can sort of see for yourself, but you're still kind of roughing it. Like, is that sort of how that period was? Yeah, I, to, to be honest, that was what just the way I had to make it work. And um, a, a, a bit like what you're saying, I was competing uh, riding for uh, Yam production type bikes uh, Yamaha out here in Australia they were supporting me a little and then and then 88 with the uh, Marlboro Yamaha local team and a little bit in, in Japan but but really you know, making a little bit of money but not enough to really yeah. live the way you'd want to live and I didn't have anything I didn't come from anything so we, we, we didn't grow up poor but I mean we didn't grow up with any sort of wealth that's for sure and then um um, so that was just the way I needed to make life work for me at the time. But but equally, like you're doing at the moment, it's just one thing after the other. And you one, you're enjoying what you're doing, and 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 two, you can see that if uh, if you work hard enough, there's potential for this to to actually work and pay off for you. So so that was a motivation. Equally, I had to sort of maintain that base because I couldn't afford anything else, yeah. and I didn't want to get ahead of myself. So. So really, um, all the way through, it's just basically been where I've threw my threw, threw my hat or, or resided each each night was really just a means to the end. I wasn't yeah. really thinking yeah. about where am I going to live in the future or what am I going to do. I, I just needed a shower and I needed a bed, and yeah. and that was it. <laughs> it. It's kind of like a a pretty simple like 
there's a lot of beauty in the simplicity of it you know and like if you contrast your life now like the the house that you guys live in right now is about as far away from that um you know the way that you were living then and like that's the goal you know like you obviously want to progress but then you look at you know you've got to have like staff that run a house and all the the different stuff that comes with it like do you look back at those times as like as is there some fondness there well absolutely some simplicity i guess as well which makes life easier but yeah. <clears throat> equally at the time when um when i built that that house you're referring to um it was about the kids and about you know having having this and that and the other that sort of makes life easy when you're out there by yourselves and by yourselves less staff but yeah. um but but equally the kids can run around you buy the water you you on a bit of land you and then the, as you say the house the finishings on the house are quite nice but the house grew as well because by the time you put um um thankfully I was only on two wheels, but a little dedicated museum type thing. And then you want a gym and you want this and you do that. The house sort of grows by the time you do it. <clears throat> but you still only live in, such in, a small... in, in the, between the bedroom and the, yeah. and the kitchen, you know. So yeah. so at the end of the day, much is the same, except you've got to maintain this load of shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think one of the, like, I, I guess I just kind of last night was just picturing the way that it must have been back then and uh you know you've got you had barry sheen that was just down the road so like you're kind of going from like a little shack type thing and uh and then you kind of got to dip into this like life of opulence when you got to hang around with barry so there there must have been like a real clear vision of like what your life could be if you kind of ticked x amount of boxes and you know continued that trajectory and and i think that's like i just said that you, you know what's out there if you mm. can achieve if you can perform deliver on what you need to to deliver on then you know anything's possible and and i think that's the difference between a lot of people they sort of get a little bit and think that uh, then it's they're happy and content yeah. with sort of what is success to somebody but really in any game business or sport <clears throat> it's only when you're at the top that you really um i, I guess reap the rewards mm. <clears throat> you might get some rewards along the way but they don't last and then they're never really the same rewards as hitting the top so hanging around with people that have mm. been successful and or meeting people who've been successful in in all walks of life not just sport sort of you just see there's a lot of similarities between the the mindsets and mm. so on and what makes the difference between somebody who's here and almost here and and yeah. and, uh, and equally if you're going to have a go you may as well give it your best shot and and i enjoyed what i what i well, i enjoy what i do and I, so i never feel i never felt like i was working yeah as such and and if i was going to have a crack i may as well have a proper crack you yeah know? there's no point going oh, i wish i would have done it a little bit different you know let's let's not leave anything on the table and then that way you can't sit around and go, I just, I wish I would have, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, back to that. So I did know that there was, you know, Moto, Moto GP even today, um, but it's the second largest motorsport on the planet you know, yeah. behind Formula One. So the rewards are there if you succeed, but it drops off the same as every other sport and yeah. every every other business. Then there's tennis, there's a couple of people in tennis and then there's a whole bunch yeah, of them. Yeah, same yeah. as golf, same as, and MotoGP, Formula One, everything you've got to is be the at same. The tip of the so you've got to be running it. But the effort to get to to the top and almost get to the top is not much different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's, you know, I'd rather put in that little bit extra effort than to finish second, you know, that would just piss me off to finish second. So. Well, it's one of the, I mean, it's probably probably more so through Maddie. Like, I'm, I mean, I get to watch a lot of like the way that you interact with him and like the, I guess the lessons that, you know, just through conversations that Maddie has with you, or he's kind of passing on that, that knowledge as <laughs> well. And, uh, <laughs> but there's been some, you know, just, to, I guess, just to watch the, the way that you move um, and the way that you work now, I can imagine the way that you were as an athlete and i think that that's probably one of the most interesting things about i guess if you want to look at you as like an athlete sports person or business person it's like there's just this motivation and this work ethic that you've got and it seems like whatever you attach 
that too like whatever you whichever way you aim that you're gonna have a result like and i just wonder where that comes from and like when did that start and what was do you even kind of think back to the original motivations or it's just always been you look i i i I really don't know but um um yeah and you not everything i do succeeds either so Mm. but i never won every race either and um and i crashed i didn't crash that often but when i did i I made sure I did it properly, and, yeah. <laughs> and and that's the same with business or life, or you know, you're never going to be in the top of your game the whole time. So you got to learn from the the experiences you, you gain along the way. But but um, sport probably um, taught me to the disciplines that you have for sport, the, everything what you need for life. So that's where I think with kids, with everything, and yeah. you know, supporting young Jack is is the same thing. It's it gives him something to focus on it gives him it teaches him life life lessons yeah. dealing with people dealing with uh with a team dealing with everybody in all walks of life and then um and, and how do you make things work for you and uh and, and so sport for me and knowing that like we spoke about earlier there's a there's an end game you yeah. know if you can get there you know then then really you've you can do what you want to a, to a degree but um and it's the same with business okay so not not everything works out well but you know if you have passionate enough and you're persistent and you commit enough then then that's about it really and and the same thing you got to know when to cut your losses you got to know when to finish second you got to yeah. know <laughs> yeah you got to and you know but you only learn all this stuff as you go yeah but, but sport teaches you a lot of that and i think that's why just general in kids i think it's great you know rather than sitting on their bloody ipads and yeah and iphones and so on get out there and get involved from a young age it just you have so many disciplines are just with all the all the basic foundations of life are sitting there right in every sport yeah and it's it's crazy with jack like he's one of our friends like he's in <laughs> our friend group and we're all in our 30s and we've all we're all doing different stuff and there's this 18 or 19 year old kid that is like in the thick of that friend group which is pretty crazy to think about i guess the way that such a young kid can actually um integrate into a group of older guys and i think that it's through the like the experiences that that he's had and through his sport and like his competitive uh nature like it's it's pushed his development along as a person a lot more than what you would think an average 19 year old could get uh, yeah absolutely um you know he's 19 next week so he's uh you know he, he, he's most most 18 19 year old kids would be out sort of partying and carrying on and and he, he enjoys life don't get me wrong but um but you know a lot of people are always oh you know he should be going to university he should be doing this he should be doing that but then who's in who's yeah. mine that's that's sort of the the, the <laughs> that's the form sheet that everybody has yeah but as you say to go out there and having to deal with the highs and lows the emotional highs the emotional lows dealing with how do you get the best out of that person and how do yeah. how can i think for myself i've got to get this the the, the school of life you just can't you can't buy yeah. so when uh you know sure you need to understand the basics and and you know when and we did educate the boy he was <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. homeschooled i'm not saying we didn't educate him but but getting a university degree, I don't think it's to be all and end all of life anyway. So if you've got the skills to communicate and work and the work ethic, then you're going to end up doing something to, uh, right. And what, what I'm saying by that, if Jack doesn't reach his goals, then, you know, I'm sure he's going to be okay anyway. Yeah, yeah. Were you proud of him at that last, uh, the last F3 race with the, the way that he communicated with the team on the radio and the way that he kept his cool it's a bit of background for anyone that didn't see uh jack did his last f3 race and it's a paid drive to get onto those teams essentially like you bring in your own sponsors um so there's no team rules in this way that like a formula one team has team rules and you gotta listen and uh there was like the constructor championship that the team was trying to win and uh, jack was pretty confident that he could beat his teammate the team asked him to move over jack said no uh and there was a pretty like uh not heated but it was a pretty direct 
conversation on the radio and Jack basically told the team that he races for himself and then he went on to win the race and they won the Constructors' Championship. So it all kind of played out to make Jack look like the fucking man, essentially. Yeah. But were you proud of that uh, dealings? Yeah, once I didn't know all that was going on when I was... Uh, oh, um, really? You know, until after the event. So... so uh, because I was, uh, I think I was watching it on an iPad in in the car park. To be honest, because you can't really see too much at the racetrack. So I was there, but it was only the text messages I got, and then I watched the, the yeah. telecast afterwards. But but yeah, absolutely. A few years earlier, again, just with experience, a few years earlier, you probably would have just yeah. sort of rolled over and and, yeah. and let the other guy go past. But you know, as you say, he did let the guy pass, and then he got him back again anyway. So so no, he, he used his head, and I was extremely proud of him. You know, extremely proud of him how he how he handled the whole year, really. But yeah. um, but that um, at that particular point in time, he stood his ground, rightly so. You know, he's winning a race at the end of the day. We'll reflect back on that now. You know, well, his teammate won. He's finished second. He helped help the team. I don't know what because they're yeah. still going to win the championship, championship anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but Jack would have lost out on a win, and so on his rap sheet, it's a, it's a, well, not rap sheet. I guess it's a, <laughs> that's a different. <laughs> but, <laughs> But uh, but he's um, but he's got the, you know we had the four wins this year and um, instead of three so which was um, which was good and the other kid had none so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that was really the gameplay there for the team uh, because they wanted all three of their drivers to have a win on this ha- have a win so that uh, then they can charge like you say for yeah. for the twenty twenty two seat they can charge more yeah so, <laughs> good right. look, well, each each driver was able to win in our car yeah you that, know, so. that makes it that makes so, a lot so, of sense. So I think Jack's been also taught all this over the years as well, and mm. you know, and he takes things on board now. He's getting a bit older. It was as I say, three or four years ago, it was a bit hard to get stuff into his head, but uh, but now he understands the politics of the sport as well. And and uh, but as you say, as you say, that the further you go up, and if if a manufacturer or a team or whatever they're paying you to actually be there, you yeah you know you can you can probably get away with it once or twice if you're actually dominating but if you if you're if you're hindering the team from performing then they probably won't allow that to happen too often but but you have seen in the past with people like mark weber and yeah and vettel you know vettel's just no 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 i'm not letting weber was up for a <laughs> at the end of the day it was both of them going to win a championship anyway yeah but, so to let uh you know, uh, Sebastian was meant to let Mark through, and he didn't do it. And you know, yeah. the, Mark's wasn't too happy about it. But at the end of the day, nobody other than people who remember watching the race and whatever will know that that was the yeah, case. They and, just and, see that. And at the end of the day, yeah. they didn't flick either driver either. So, you know, it's not meant to happen in sport, but it does more so in 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 the four wheel side of things. In two wheels. There's no real communication. I think now they've got sort of some text yeah. messaging stuff, but um, on on the on the dash. But I think um, if if there was a team play or a, or a championship play, that that'd be sort of spoken about um, before you go out. But I can assure you that during my time racing bikes, there was never any sort of team orders, and there was never there there was sometimes where you're sort of hoping that it could could have been and. Uh, but there was certainly never. Um, you, you basically, if you if you couldn't beat your teammate, then yeah. bad luck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, the, there was a just to stay on Jack for another second. Like a massive, massive change from seeing him this time last year to to this year. Like to, it really feels like a massive growing year for him. And you know, you think about everything that he went through all those races on live tv and then you know to win four races and you know he lived over there by himself for for a lot of the year in monaco um and yeah like you know to talk about that going to university or whatever it's like you cannot get the experience of the pressure of being on live tv to millions and millions of people at 18 years old you know living by yourself like it's a it's a crazy thing that he's gone through no absolutely and and there's there's a fair amount of pressure there to perform as well and uh, you know he, he has to perform even though you you're buying the drive essentially um one, you need to be in a good position to get a good seat, even if you're buying the seat. Yeah. And then um, two, um, um, to, to be able to progress with the, with, with the sport, you need to be able to perform. Um, but also then winning, 
and then builds a bit of confidence. So then it just all feeds off each other. But, he, you know, the, the boy was putting in the work. He's training. He's sort of working on the mental side of things. He's working to make it all happen. And, uh, yeah, I think I think as hard as that, uh, what year are we, 2020 was, was for him yep. um, with HWA. I think it's also taught him it was a, a, a very poor year. They, they've now left the sport um, because they were struggling in both F3 and F2 since the three years they were in there. Um, but I, I think that just because he was, he was doing quite well in all the other classes until he hopped into that, that car. Yeah. And then he's hopped straight in that Trident and all of a sudden he's felt he can drive again, you know. So, yeah. so it's essentially the same car. It's just the way they prepare him. So that gave him a big confidence boost. But likewise, running in a car, what really all they were doing was putting fuel and doing the putting fuel in and putting the seatbelts, doing the seatbelts up, and he's having to try and do the rest, and it's just impossible. So he's driving, he's driving as hard as he could possibly drive that thing, and it probably helped him to be honest because yeah. he's driving a, a piece of piece of junk. You know, it's a relative, <laughs> relative yeah. in a big picture. You know, it's a great car, but it's it just wasn't set as way the way it should have been. So he's driving around a lot of problems, which you can't really drive around. All the, the whole team were. Mm. So then, when he hopped in a, a good car, when it's not really working well, it's it, uh, it it's put him in a better position. And uh, like I say, you don't win every race. You don't. You learn a lot by uh, sometimes being being on the um, in cockroach court. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's so true. So do you, do you think back or like? do you think uh like think back to that age when you were jack's age and like the i guess the it's so different in terms of the time but are you guys were you going through the same kind of things and emotions not really and- like at 18 i was uh, 18 19 i was um probably a little out of control i wasn't sort of i didn't get to europe until 23 24 yeah. so sort of in my sort of 20 21 22 23 a bit of racing out here um dirt bikes when i was younger and then sort of in no man's land for a little while so for the sports changed everything is now younger in it's all just disciplines. Back, yeah. yeah so um so a different side of things so yeah um you know my brothers and i we, we sort of speak about this and i think not just not just within our family but i think anybody sort of in our era is the same thing at that age what we were doing and what the, they're doing today is completely different and um and really that's you've just got to commit from such a young age these yeah in this era otherwise you're just left by the wayside you can't really come in at uh, you can't really start thinking about racing at 20 years old no. and then <laughs> and then going on you know you, you just left left by the wayside so a different mindset i think once um for me jack is probably where i was probably around that 24 25 period you know yeah. I, I know that i'm i've got the ability to to race with these guys and now i just need to i need to deliver i need to actually put it and perform and and if i don't perform you know why aren't i performing and i need to work on myself a little bit and for me that's where i can see jack is at the moment he knows he can drive yeah um and he now understands the 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 the, the benefits of of working hard mm. to 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 achieve the goal it's not just about hopping in the car it's not just about training it's you know it's it's about the whole package the mental side of it and, mm. and like with everything everything is mental so i had casey on uh the other day and we were talking about i guess like his mentality around everything is just sacrifice 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 like you get this really short period to make you know like you're one of the athletes where you just gave everything for that period of time and then you can leave the sport and then i mean you continue to work but in terms of like financially you can you set you can do what you want to do like you can literally have an early retirement um and i guess did you see it that same way like you just said i'm just gonna sacrifice like give my life to this for this period of time and then i'll be set you know or yeah i I wasn't so much about i I knew that there was upside of performing and winning and and whatever else don't get me wrong but it was more about wanting to do it for myself as i said like there was sacrifices or just commitment um you know i don't know whether you call them sacrifices um, if you enjoy it you know i was enjoying it but you sort of like you you 
sacrifice has been that you've left your country mm. to go and compete again in something you wanted to compete in um with working with the best of the best from the manufacturers and and so so you look at it a couple of different ways you know am i not um, no i'm not down in the pub playing bloody yeah. pool yeah. on a friday night you know if that's a sacrifice and you know i knew that if i survived the era then um then i could always come back and have a game of pool and a pub yeah, that yeah. i hadn't been in since i was 18 you know so but likewise um i come back at the end of each year for a few weeks and uh you know all the people that i grew up with were doing exactly the same thing as i was yeah <laughs> i was doing when i left and year on year on so it was um so you rec you really you soon realize that you're really not sacrificing yeah. a great deal and yeah. in fact you actually um you're enjoying it but you know the things you're sacrificing i guess like with anything when you you know the, the guys who um have started any sort of successful business if sacrifices and putting your life into to achieve what you're trying to achieve then then and then and then have the success and the and the uh, i guess the um what's the word i'm looking for but i mean like to, the lifestyle that comes well with it not so or, much a lifestyle but just the um to to reach your goal yeah and okay. succeed and and to deliver yeah. on what you've uh, what you've set out to achieve and, and the same with you with this type of thing what's your end goal you know i'd love to do this and love to do that and a byproduct is this you yeah, know so yeah. it's not real it's never really you know the, the the business is a i mean the sport is a business at the end of the day and then business is a sport now that's right yeah. and, and likewise back then so yeah so when you're negotiating contracts it's it's almost a game to be honest so you're, you're yeah. playing what can you get away with you know can let's let's throw the rules out and let's just try and do it this way and uh, so that teaches you a lot as you go but but i mean back to the sacrifice thing and achieving your goals is what it was more about and then as i say if i if i was able to get through it and and achieve my goals i knew that um yeah, financially things should take care of themselves but it wasn't something that uh, that i really said about going okay well this year i might be able to make 10 bucks and you know yeah. and that's all i'm focused on now i'm focused about winning yeah and if i win enough then that 10 bucks will uh, will land up in my pocket yeah and it's funny you said that about you come home for those couple of weeks a year and it's just the same i got that when i first went to america i went to america f when i was like 21 for two months i stayed over i had literally no money in my bank account i just slept on people's couches the entire time and just tried to film and work and i come back home and everything was the same yeah. my room was the same everyone was doing the same things it's like i didn't even miss out on any conversations mm. like and instantly when that happened i was like oh i'm done i'm yeah. le i'm leaving i'm out of here because i just kind of I, I i don't know like some people won't leave or they think that this crazy change or they're going to miss out on so much and it stops them from actually going away but i mean i went away for eight years over there and mm. i come back and it yeah. was still the same that's right and that's what i mean and then and everybody lives their life differently but but uh, the people who have a crack and they have a crack properly generally achieve what they're having a crack at mm. because they're they're willing to hop off that couch and they're willing to sort of sacrifice again if that's the word you use yeah. not going to the pub on the saturday or friday afternoon or whatever to see their mates but you know you soon learn that you can come back six months 12 months 36 months later yeah. have a beer with them and they're still doing the same thing talking the same shit you know yeah. Talking, yeah. and uh, and really in 10 20 years time they're still doing the same a lot of these a lot of the guys so and that's not to say that that's the wrong way to yeah. do things but yeah. but i think if you've got if you've got an itch that you need to scratch and you need to have a crack and and go yeah. and see if it's worth worth pursuing but because uh, if you don't if you don't do it then uh you know we one of those people i could have done that yeah. you know i could have, well fuck why didn't you <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh and um and it's all the way through life you hear it and i'm sure the same with some of some of your friends and whatnot but um but look i think it's all about about yourself and what you enjoy and 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 the same with what i do now i enjoy you know some sometimes um uh, you know looking after young jack takes up a lot of time hopefully sort of uh, somebody can take over that position <laughs> soon yeah but but then blending that in with what i do as well but to, to me you know and and for sure some of the other family members my, my wife and my daughter sometimes 
miss out and jack as well because i'm working so much but i enjoy it yeah. so i don't know what else i sit around and i'm like i'm not somebody who's going to sit on the beach i'm not somebody yeah. who's going to so so um that's a that's a super hard balance and i think about that shit a lot because i'm that guy too like i just for whatever reason i just don't want to sit down i don't want to chill like everything like the thing that makes me feel good in life is like progressing and i think what i've tried to do is i've tried to like narrow down the areas in which i'm even able to progress so i've got in my mind i've got like five categories it's like my my health like body and mind and then i've got like jujitsu reading work and then motocross and it's like that's kind of my things and i just want to get better at those things and like all of my days are filled by just like these little yeah. bits of progression in each one of these mm. verticals and it's like it'd be really hard for me to take time away from those to just like do nothing and i and i i, I see that with you it's like you just enjoy what you're doing and it's like what's the point of when we spoke the other day i was like fuck i don't know why we take holidays because like you come back and everything's just where <laughs> yeah. you left it and That's then you right. just got to keep trudging through yeah. so uh, have you thought about i guess just that whole process of I don't know, like, why is that why we are, in a way? Yeah, I'm not sure. I enjoy it. I think that's the main thing as well. I think if you enjoy what you do, and it's certainly, like, with everything, there's some things that aren't that enjoyable. Um, but most of the stuff I just enjoy, I'm sort of always wanting to see yeah. what's, <laughs> yeah. what's happening and and um, and progressing. But I don't mind the odd the odd small break, um, yeah. as, you, as you say, but then you come back and you've got to sort of catch up on a bunch of stuff anyway but but yeah i can't sit around in the same place for too long and and, and do nothing without starting to think or starting to creep back into opening of some of the technology we have today which sort of is non-stop so um but uh, but I, i'm not sure where, you know what you do about that but <laughs> yeah. i i enjoy it anyway yeah. yeah so to go back to the the era like that kind of 88 89 like right before you kind of made the shift and like the career really started like heading in that direction what was the gold coast like and the the scene for like racing dirt track and motocross and, and road racing like what was the scene that you're involved in that kind of like made you think that you actually could go overseas and you could make a career of that because there's got to be there's always like a, a tipping point i guess to where you go from like just enjoying the lifestyle that you're living to being like man if i do this this and this I could be MotoGP world champion. I could be, um, you know, the guy that you see for yourself in the future. Yeah, it's it's difficult to uh, to probably um, identify one one thing, but the Gold Coast back in the eighties was pretty much just a strip, a coastal strip. So, <clears throat> um, and and back in the seventies and eighties, motorcycles were were a lot more. Uh, I, I guess. Uh, there, there was motorcycle market was a lot larger in Australia is probably the easiest thing to say across the board so yeah. I think in the 70s with per capita Australia was one of the and not really that that's my time but um, but one of the largest per capita sales in the world and uh, so I think it, in the 70s really motorcycle racing in australia took off with the likes of Stephen gore yeah. and, and you know i was a young guy racing dirt bikes and stuff around with all that and then the 80s um started a bit of road racing and and here in a and the gold case had surface paradise uh racetrack which was just a carrara oh, which really? is em emerald lakes now yeah. i think is out there so and i was living a mermaid so you could go out there and pay 20 bucks um 20 bucks a um 20 bucks a week i'm mean, not 20 bucks a week 20 bucks a day to to run around the racetrack which is pretty damn good yeah <laughs> and um and then lakeside so basically i just um i fell into it um i had a i had a uh, uh, an rz350 that um a friend of mine had uh had uh tried a wheelie on and flipped it and i didn't have any money to uh, to fix it and a friend who had the gold coast motorcycle record said that he would fix it if i did a race on it so yeah, i thought that right. was a uh, a fair call so i did a race on it and i finished second to the australian champion at the time i think wow. it was terry pavio or pavel or i can't remember how do you pronounce his name a good guy and um 
And pretty much that guy, um, I came in a couple of weeks later, you know, I was happy the bike was fixed and everything was good, didn't think much of it. And he said, um, you know, Mick, what, what are you interested in doing, racing bikes or just sort of cruising around as you're doing? And I said, well, if you give me a hobby, you know. <laughs> and it went from there. He then organised a motorcycle through Donny Pask Motorcycles, which was here at Mermaid Beach at the time. And um, and Suzuki Australia gave me a little 250 production bike. And wow. Things went from there, and then Yamaha started supporting me with production bikes, and then, and then probably the biggest step was um, um, I uh, I went to Japan in '87 <clears throat> um, to do a Suzuka eight-hour thing. Yeah, and the bike we broke. I was with a guy, an, an Australian, Rod Cox, who was a very well-known guy, um, and I think I've was as quick if not quicker than him there and the Japanese sort of noticed me at the Suzuka radar even though the engine broke with him on it and, and we didn't finish but then they invited me back for some races after that and I finished third in the world championship race um, 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 and uh, Kevin McGee had won and um, uh, uh, before the there was before Superbike it was Formula Formula TT Formula One or something like that it was called and uh, so uh, and then the 88 was um <clears throat> the first year of world superbike and i did two two rounds of those and i the four races i finished i won three of them and crashed in the other one wow so and i think that was a catalyst and that barry sheen you were saying barry sheen helped a little bit introduce me to a few people and um but uh but we're winning those three races and i think the australian round Again, I had good bikes. Yamaha gave me factory. There wasn't such a thing as a factory superbike back then, but I had a factory superbike, wow. so, which helped. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but in in uh, at Oran Park in Sydney in '88, uh, qualified pole. I won both races, and I lapped I think the whole field up to about third or fourth. You know, so um, so that was. And there was a, some of the little that I know. Honda were actually at the races there, and then they come and seen me after the race. <laughs> and then uh, so that was really probably the springboard that then yeah. was like okay well you know which way am i going and who am i going to ride for and whatever else and i and i ended up going for um yamaha wanted me to to spearhead their their superbike challenge i had an offer from suzuki as well uh, to be kevin schwantz's teammate and then um and i decided with honda one because gardner i thought um you know, Gardner was a few years older than me, so, you know, I was a little bit naive. I can't go with that because they know I'll be the next guy. And then also my father had a Honda shop when we were younger. Yeah. So um, so I went down that path, but pretty much that was it. So I went from start of 87 riding a 250cc production bike to the start of 89 on a 500cc Grand Prix bike. So I missed out a lot of that stuff in the middle, <laughs> yeah. which is, you know, yeah. other type of racing bikes and whatever else. But... But um, and you, again, you need to sort of work hard. The first the first six months on that five hundred was pretty damn hard. Yeah. So you were just fucking hungry for it. Like you got got an opportunity because it's it's just crazy to hear that you're super blasé and had like this. Oh, I'll just do a ride so that I can get my bike fixed. To then just being a fucking animal. <laughs> so like what that transition seems like it happened pretty pretty quick. It, it did. I, I felt comfortable on the road bike straight away. A dirt bike <clears throat> I, I wasn't that great on a dirt bike. I think, you know, there was a couple of us here, there's a guy by the name of Stephen Freiberg was always sort of winning most of the things when we were kids and and then another guy, um, Thompson, somebody, um but we're always there was always, you know, three or four of us sort of running around but I could, I, I sort of, I'd win the club days and win, but then the state stuff, you know, I was always, you know, I think the best I got was a second somewhere. Yeah. Um, and, um, but on a road bike straight away, the bike moving around underneath me and whatever else, I never had any problem with. So for, for me, you know, of course the dirt biking, motocross and, and, and flat track stuff helped. But when I hopped on the, the road bike, it just felt natural to me. So the thing with the front wheel sliding, the rear wheel moving around, it, uh, it just, it was no problem so when i think that helped me yeah. and um and um so <laughs> straight away it was you know what's 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 so difficult about this thing but yeah <laughs> yeah and uh it wasn't so much being an animal it just i just felt com comfortable on the thing and so yeah. i just push it a little bit further than than other guys probably were willing to and i guess uh that does make sense that if 
you get on like because I'm, I'm assuming that you would have been like super into motocross and dirt track and like you would have if you were spending that time racing you would have wanted to win at that but then there's these guys that are just better than you and beating you and there's probably like because I guess I was I was pretty shit at motocross like I was not that good at all I've never really been that good at any sport and then I started doing jiu-jitsu and it was just like a light switch right. for me like I was just good at it pretty well straight away which that's not the case for people you know and uh and it made me want to do good at it because it came super easy to me and uh and then it it's not that it is easy but when it comes easier to you you can see the road to progression whereas in moto i was like i could train forever at this and i just won't be good whereas i kind of saw i was like with jiu-jitsu i'm like if i train like i could actually be really good was that sort of what it was like in a way and i guess so yeah for sure it's um and i knew that it uh um well everything was relatively easy until i hopped on a 500 really and then it was a little bit of a <laughs> i don't think that was easy for anyone <laughs> no but i mean it was really sort of a bit of a rejig on how to how does a bike work because it was a completely different motorcycle and everything else i've ridden but um but yeah and, and the same thing you know i could see the progression i could see that it was relatively easy everything if anything the the bigger the bike and the and the and the 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 you know the, from the 250 to a, a 250 street bike that is to a thousand cc street bike to a, a, a super bike they were all easier for me it just kept getting easier with these the bikes got bigger or faster or whatever and it was probably just because they were prepared better or they mm. were just you know a 250 street bike is exactly that it's a cheap little bike and the thousands a little bit built a little bit better and so and then the super bike same sort of thing it's it's now built to try and go on a racetrack so was a 500 was completely different but but equally i i knew that i was um capable of riding the things probably a little bit better but if i mean if i focused in on that and gave a hundred percent commitment then then perhaps anything's possible so and that's really what i focused on and as i said i'd put in that little bit extra effort to to make sure that i'm winning to stay on top of the game was a hell of a lot easier than having to sort of finish second and go and i wish yeah. i would have <laughs> yeah yeah it, it makes so much sense and then so uh you go to the i guess to fast forward um uh, a little bit like the the 500 such a crazy error in motorcycling and you know i was watching a bunch of um stuff last night and like you you definitely the style's so different now but did you have a different style for like coming into the 500s like was there something that you think you were doing differently than other guys or not not really like everyone's got a bit of a different style and i i think a lot of um a lot of the styles back then were from dirt biking you know and especially on a left hand side a left hand turn everyone sort of got a bit of a for me left hand corners were sort of always a little bit easier than right so from i think dirt it, tracking yeah, yeah and uh you know and i'd sit down you'd sit across the bike yeah at um and you sort of control the bike underneath you sort of when and when it's moving around the right so i was a bit more traditional road racer type on the right because it was sort of a little bit foreign to me but um but um i, I think back then there wasn't the hang off like there is there is now um so we, we got um I used to sort of hang off, hang off my uh, my my butt more than the others. The others would be sort of my butt was down, so my body my, the body mass was down low, yeah. And then my upper body was up a bit higher. Kevin Schwantz was probably a bit similar, but then there was others which were a bit uh, different. Today everyone's hanging off and putting the elbow down. There was there was a guy uh, Jean Philippe Brugier, you know, he was doing that in the nineties, and uh, you know everyone thought, what are you doing? And now it's everyone's doing it, you know, <laughs> but. Uh, but yeah, I, the only time, the only time I'd scrape my elbow when I was scraping every other part of my <laughs> was body. Was when your forehead was <laughs> but, also on the ground. <laughs> but uh, you know, sometimes you'd almost lose the bike, you lose the front or whatever, and you touch the elbow as you're trying to save it. Um, and then that was about the only thing. But but generally, um, generally, uh, it wasn't so much about the style what sort of style you got or how you looked on the bike it was what what worked what, worked, what, yeah. what felt comfortable and and that's what um uh, i know uh 
a lot of guys goes, you know, how should I, how should I sit on the bike? And how do you feel comfortable? You know, everyone's got a different style. It's like, what's fast? What works for you? You know, because if you start to try and put yourself in a different position, I think it's difficult. At the end of the day, you want to get the bike in there, get it turned, get it up, and, and fire it out. You know, now today, the it's more about the corner speed. There's a lot more corner speed. There's a lot more side grip. The yeah. suspension's a lot better, but the tires also can handle staying on its side. And when I say side grip, can stay on the side for a lot longer. Whereas before, you just sort of break, turn it in, sort of max lean for a, for a puff teeth, and then pick the thing up and fire it out. And then, uh, so um, so for instance, sometimes in qualifying, you'd set up for a lap, and then you'd re-gear the bike for the race. Yeah, so right. So to fire it up because you knew you couldn't maintain that that lean, yeah, that lean for yeah. the race. So then you'd change the gearing because you need to have it up and then firing out. So you got to slow your mid corner speed up, and then, uh, and then you know over the length of the race, the first ten laps you all together, and then you slowly start to to break it away. So it was all these type of things that were uh, different than than they are now, and, and you know you've got all the traction controls and whatever else, which um, we certainly didn't have at that point in time, and there was no, there was really no indication of any of that and there was no we didn't need slipper clutches on a on a two stroke because there was yeah, no, no engine, engine brake. braking yeah so so um, but even back in the day in the four strokes back in these ttf ones and super bikes and whatever else slipper clutches started to come into them at the uh, towards the end of the time i was running them but but still just using the clutch to there's a free wheel going into turns yeah yeah. so rather than you know the thing sliding around we just pull the clutch in and then and work it on the way out so you know and a lot of these uh it, it is what it is today that's the way that everyone has to ride them and but um, the good guys would still be able to compensate and, and yeah. use other things anyway so i think all the all the all the traction control does was was bring the uh the 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 mid-pack guys closer to the closer. front <laughs> yeah so what was the uh like were you always a dude that was down to go super fast like was that something you always enjoyed or was it something that you kind of got used to like because how much did fear play a part in those early early days of road racing because it's very very different to go from riding a dirt bike and you know doing dirt track to going two three hundred k's an hour i i the the speed never excited me to be honest and if anything that was something i was i i was scared of so that's when back to a 250 production bike i never wanted to ride anything faster mm. uh you know 200k back then that's around what they were doing 200 210 on the 250 on the 250 yep. street bike stuff and um and you know that was fast enough but then when you start you get on the racetrack well number one you, you, de- they, you don't have a speedometer on the thing anyway there's no <laughs> so speed you so you're not really sort of watching that <laughs> It's only when you crash that you realise how fast you're going, or mm. you're off on the grass. You know, somebody push you off on the grass, and you realise how quick you're going. So, speed become irrelevant. It's more how quick and how you get get your eye in, as you you hear in many different things. But, um, so it was nothing about um, that and and fear. I think you need a healthy dose of fear to keep yourself safe. So, yeah. And um, so people often say you've got to be fearless, you've got to be this. No, if anything, you need fear. Yeah. And you just need to know how to manage that and <clears throat> and, and know where that that grey area is, you know, because you push yourself into that grey area and then things will turn turn to brown real quick. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, but I mean, the closer you can stay at that, um, that grey and the age of that grey area, the further it gets pushed out. And I think that was, you just got to understand where that is yeah. and keep working to try and, to, to try and keep pushing that grey area out. And, um, but, but yeah, you need that healthy dose of fear, otherwise you're going to hurt yourself and hurt everyone else around you. Well, because that was one of the interesting things talking to Casey is that he said that he was just so scared his entire career. And even, you know, you look at, like turn three for instance at Phillip Island the way that he goes into that turn you that's where you go like he is fearless but he said that he developed his style through that turn because he was so scared of losing the front that he needed to develop a way to feel like he could never lose the front in that turn and it just so happened to result in a 260 kilometer an hour power slide for you know for seconds but that was him trying to deal with the fear and then i mean i think the the gnarliest part of the fear thing is maybe not so much being on the bike but you go through the crash that you had in 92 
and then you literally end up getting your legs sewn together because of how bad the injury was to promote blood flow and then your legs go back to you know you then you get your legs separated and then you've got to look at the 93 season and you know you're pretty much riding 93 with one leg like that to me i think is where the fear must really come in like if you can go back to like that period of your life and you think about the mental things that you had to deal with to go from that 92 crash to even racing a bike again like that i think is probably more so when the fear would come in yeah i i think um if you hurt yourself and you don't know why you've hurt yourself then mm. then it's a different thing but you know number one, one uh, i think anybody in a sport like that or in in sport in general at a professional level um other than golf i guess you know there's a few other sports that perhaps you don't think injuries are you're going to get taken out by something but yeah. um you know when you're in a on a motor motorcycle race in any way you you understand that you can injure yourself seriously you know there's a possibility of, of killing yourself you know or being killed in a race and whatever so you've got to sort of process that anyway and when you do hurt yourself you almost you're almost prepared for it anyway mm -hmm. so it's like well okay like here i am i get it yeah and uh, so what do I need to do to get to get going but if there's a bunch of uh, and people do lose confidence sometimes because they don't know one what happened or they help back on again and then they crash again they don't know what happened mm. because I think they're in that gray zone and they keep they've they're really a they're, they're outside of their they're they're outside of their ability yeah and then they keep crashing and they don't know why instead of pulling it back and then slowly Just progressing slowly again yourself back up so <clears throat> so yeah I, when i had those injuries coming back on for sure it's unknown i don't know what um what i'm going to be like especially with some of the injuries i had i didn't have the, the right uh, the rear brake and the right foot and the right foot didn't move and then uh, so all this type of stuff so you have to adjust so it's just a matter of working back through again so these are the things that are a little bit scary to me yeah rather than can i ride the bike you know and then um it's just working your way forward again and uh and and then the other thing you're scared about is if i crash again is how, gonna, yeah. how strong is the leg yeah you know because it wasn't and, even together really for the 93 season right 93 no it was uh it was still it was a, a non-union essentially so it was it was uh they finished the end of that year with about a with about a, almost a 20, 15 to 20 degree angulation in the leg, but I could grab my um, ankle and my knee and you could flex the, the leg. So, so that's, uh, I finished, um, I, um, I crashed in Laguna Seca in the States while leading in 93. Um, and uh, through the injury, I just didn't have the strength. I was using too much upper, upper body through the corkscrew and, and, uh, and flick the bike up off the ground, just, instead of because you normally steer it with your feet and you still do today but um <clears throat> you just didn't have the power power in that foot in the in the so and then it's it's the bike gets light anyway and the bike stepped out i ended up running off the crash anyway i ended up crashing and i stayed in the states i think i was running third in the championship at that point in time and i think um daryl Beatty was running um was running fourth i could have went back for the next race and i'm probably probably maintain the third position but third fourth it didn't really matter yeah, to me yeah. it was um and so i stayed in the u.s to fix the leg um and uh, and put this ilazaroff uh external fixator device on with a guy who's now a friend of mine um dr kevin louie in, in in the u.s so so I put that together got the leg back straight and 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 healed and then essentially started to, you know, now all the all the um all the all the road racing boots are like motocross boots but but alpine stars um i was with another manufacturer for, for boots and suits and so on called nankai in japan but they were like a super cheap auto for yeah for, so really <laughs> yeah. they didn't make suits they, they was just promoting their brand now they had about a hundred odd stores in, in in japan but gabrielli um uh, from Alpine Stars, yep. the owner said he'd do a boot for me. We just had to non-brand wow. it, and it was a like a clamshell, like a plaster yep. uh, boot because I couldn't move my ankle anyway. So it was just to help if I did smack it on on the ground, and then uh, so that was the start of those type of things. But 
But yeah, 93 was uh, running just to keep a contract because I was... Um, because that was a contract year, right? You didn't yeah, have a contract so, for 94. <clears throat> no, so I only did from uh, I did nine, nine, from 92 onwards, I only did a um, single single contract. Uh, really? Uh, contracts. Really? Single year contracts, I should so say. So even from world championship to world championship, yeah, you yeah. wanted to just stay one stay, year? Yeah. And was so, that just a like a business play on your that's end? That's right, yeah. So, and if it, worked, if it worked, if <laughs> yeah. it worked, you know, and then you had everyone chasing you for, so it, was put, it, it did put me in a strong position. Um, uh, but <laughs> it uh, like it happened in '93. If if the shit hit the fan, then then everybody else is is telling them that I'm never going to come back. You know, Wayne Gardner had uh, retired in '92. He's saying that Mick's never going to be the same. Really? You know, in well, '92 he retired, but he retired. He didn't have a place at Honda. He didn't. You know, so he could have went to a second tier team. He decided to go car racing because um, '92 that they wanted Daryl Beatty and and uh, Wayne convinced them to keep him um, but uh, so then that, that was that and then Honda started to think about that and then uh, then Eddie Lawson I think was also uh, had retired in 92 so they well, maybe we just put Eddie in for a few races and you know you can't afford to let anybody take a seat for a few races yeah you no. know, and he does well and then all of a sudden you're struggling to get your seat back so so I had to just continue to ride just to secure and, and and convince them that I could ride even if it was only with one and a half legs and uh, and then so I get, get, get myself another to, to, to get another contract for for 94 and uh, which I did I won a race in in Mugello that year but um, but I could consistently run in the top three or four um, with with one leg once I'd once I'd organize a rear brake yeah right and so did you have anyone doing your contracts with you or was it pretty much were you your own manager throughout the career no or? i had a guy who was sort of helping me from the early days um and uh so we we being he and i were doing doing it all together um but he was um he was uh he certainly was on top of um on top of how to work with the with the manufacturers at that time but he was just based here on the gold coast he'd come to one or two races yeah you know so so you pretty much ran your own your own program 100 percent. so and then that was we just play the game so for people that don't know now so like you've got jet craft and you've got a bunch of uh different businesses that you're in and like the the competitive like your competitive spirit from racing essentially just transferred straight into business like it's you've got the same sort of drive and you've got the same sort of motivations like when did that love for business start like was it through the process of your career like dealing with your own like contracts and and then you started to get more money and then you wanted to make that money work or like how did that because it it's i find it pretty amazing that you come from essentially like not nothing but you just a super humble like you know blue collar aussie background and now you know you mix with some of the biggest business people um in the world and it's like a fun thing like you love doing that so like when did that transition kind of start to really have like that business mindset um you're right probably through some of the negotiations with um with the manufacturers and other sponsors and whatever else throughout uh, the time I was competing. But equally at that point in time, I, I did start to invest in different asset classes and, and whatever else. And then um, and then the aviation stemmed from an aircraft that I had when I was competing. Yeah. And then when I stopped competing, I didn't didn't really have a use for it, but I didn't want to get rid of it either. So um, yeah. So then it's, well, we'll put this to work and and then businesses have just uh, flourished off that i guess it's just a ripple effect and over the years um have grown into quite large businesses and um and um and then on the on the other side the um, just the investment side of things have also sort of working hard with those so so it's really just been an ongoing yeah um and the same with sport if i'm going to do it we've got to do it properly and uh and um and just have the right people around us back to dealing with people yeah, i deal with a lot of different people from all di- all walks of life but most people i've found who are successful or yeah uh, uh, in any in any walk of life are generally normal people yeah and it's you know once you think you're good <laughs> you're generally not you know yeah. you stop learning so yeah. so most people i've found who have who've 
done this, done that. Um, they're generally open, open to want to know and learn and, and listen and, and, and get a deal done versus, you know, hang on, don't you know who I am? No, yeah. I don't, mate. <laughs> so, yeah. And then you miss out on so many opportunities. And I think that's what I've learned. Uh, you know, one, when I was competing, the guys up the front were generally, you know, cooler than school. It's always the dudes in the middle. <laughs> yeah. And it's still the same now, you know. It's a, you know, the guy with a suit on, you know, like, uh, you know, and you got your T-shirt on and it's like, come on. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then uh, and the guy's still wearing a suit, you know, when he's 65 retiring because he just wouldn't take the time out to sort of say hello to somebody. And, yeah. And I think, you know, that's a very broad way of thinking about it, but but really there's dickheads everywhere and <laughs> but generally most of the people that uh, are successful in something i've found and i'm not putting myself in that class but i mean uh, most of the people are generally you treat them well they treat you well and and um and and it's pretty easy to to deal with them and then they're, they're after exactly the same thing as what you're after yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll um i'll take some photos of like the a few pages of this book i uh, i just read me and matty have been reading it actually it's called skin in the game right and uh he he talks about uh basically like why you should always pick the surgeon that doesn't look like a surgeon <laughs> so like you've got the if you've got a surgeon that you're going in and he's all got the suit and it like looks like the stereotypical surgeon like he's obviously compensating for something in, right. in that role whereas if you get a surgeon that looks like a fucking dude that's just been down the pub but he's still at the table having the conversation then he's got there in spite of not giving a fuck about all of the things that you yeah. should do i'll uh, i'll screenshot no and well that, that's the same as i was saying that uh, kevin dr kevin louie in the states there who put me back together and uh, he he's just a normal guy one of the best trauma surgeons in the world at that time you know and and possibly still is he's he's uh, well he's he's older than me so he's getting on and then um but just cool in school and the same thing. At the end of the day, a, a surgeon is just a mechanic. Yeah. You know, they put put things back together. And uh, and we've all had that surgeon, who, you know, when the doctor, you know, don't you know I'm a doctor? You know, no, yeah. mate, no, I don't really <laughs> yeah. care. Yeah. So, whereas, you know, the, the good surgeons, the same thing. The good surgeons are just normal runabout blokes. And um, and I've got a bunch of, you know, Unfortunately, I've got I've got to meet a bunch, <laughs> a bunch of, of uh, surgeons. a bunch of surgeons, and, and a number of them we're, we're friends today. They love red wine. I don't know whether it uh, reminds them of blood or whatever, but you know, <laughs> there's plenty of plenty of evenings um, drinking different bottles of red wine. It's it's, it's great. So uh, the when you I, I always get I don't, I've got a fascination with that transition of going from not having money to having life changing money and maybe it's because we grew up not that well off and you know you see especially in athletes like you go from this period of yeah like cockroach court to you know having a, a, at one point like a eight figure contract with you know with honda and moto gp what was that transition like to live through is it a weird thing to go through or is it something you didn't really even pay much mind to didn't really you know you just you just transition and it's not something that it's just from one day to the next it's sort of you're immersed in the game mm. so it's sort of you just roll with it as you're going so it's not something you really sort of thought about you just you do recognize that you're in a different position because you're not having to where am i going to get the the five bucks to pay for that mm. um that big mac for instance you know yeah. or whatever um so so that's about the only thing which changes but at the end of the day you still live the same and um but but you're really you're there to perform and do what you're actually enjoying doing and where you've set your goals and how you're going to achieve those and the rest of it's just the byproduct yeah. you know and then yeah. uh, it, it's it's just all a bonus all that type of stuff and then and then back to the business side of it you've got to do something you need to invest or you need to do um um, you, you need to to understand what to, what to do with uh, with with that uh, position you're in, and um, and you've got a bunch of people trying to advise you in this direction and that direction. So it just puts you in a different position, and then so it makes you think about it more. But as far as from being from from A to where the end game was, it's it really it it you never really sort of you well. 
you do go well jesus where did i well, how did i get how'd in I that position yeah. that position and and well i've well exceeded anything i ever thought i'd achieve but um but really i think and you hear it so often but you know you never really chase the money well one you did you you did you sorry do you do know that if you're successful that you know the money's going to take care of itself but it's it's not really that you never put a set number on it and yeah, where is yeah. this you know at the end of the day at the beginning it was like shit if i can if i can have enough money to to sort of cover my <laughs> to live off that would be yeah. that would be perfect and then it gets to a it does become a game in the end it, you know it's business but it becomes a game and and uh, and and then and then you need to 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 find a way to work with that as well yeah 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 it's just i don't know whether i explained that correctly it uh no but, uh, but, it uh, makes sense <clears throat> but it's uh it's not really something that i ever really thought about and and life changing i don't think yeah sure my life's in a different position now but i don't think it's ever changed my you know changed me yeah and um but certainly um being financially secure certainly sort of alleviates a lot of pressures which sort of you had prior to that anyway yeah because it, it definitely can change people though like you know you can see different athletes and you can see um you know people that they get contracts and they end up blowing a bunch of money and then it takes their focus away from from you know like the task at hand and, and i definitely always had that thinking where like success is just a byproduct of the process that you follow every single day like there's sort of there's not really a point having a goal if you don't have a process that would get you to that goal and i think that that's something that i think a lot of people get wrong just in in their daily life is like you can you know you can have a goal to lose weight but the goal doesn't help you lose weight no. what helps you lose weight is like the process but then the same thing is you know the lose weights the, the, the people lose weight and then as soon as they get to their goal then they yeah 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 <laughs> blast out again so same thing if you had a had a plan to, to, to earn a dollar and once you got the dollar and then if you go back to the same old way then all of a sudden you haven't got the dollar any longer and uh, so so again i think you need to to have that mindset of regardless the success will come yeah. and you really only need what you need and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so away you go was it uh was it crazy for a point though when the titles start rolling in you're living in monaco and you're around all these people like and you were in the era before the internet and before social media and before like you could operate in secret in a in a sense you know what i mean like not every party that you'd be at there'd be someone with a smartphone that'd be recording you and like i could imagine because that's one thing Casey talked about. Like he got into the sport at the end of like your era, mm. and then when he got into it, came the the crazy TV and the internet and the the more media side of things. Like really exploded to where you know he, he wasn't in that same position. But it seems like your era of you know the mid nineties, and you you see it with like Jeremy McGrath and all of those kind of eras. It was like that seemed like the one to be in in a way yeah the the, the media uh, presence was always huge but yeah it was all print media yeah essentially so a lot of things were always two weeks out of date or whatever yeah. because the internet there was a yeah we the internet was sort of slowly around and um but it wasn't it wasn't to the point of what it is now and then all, all the publications being online and all this type of thing and there certainly wasn't uh the digital cameras were coming out at that time but i mean they were still a camera they weren't uh, they weren't part of a telephone and all this type of thing so um <clears throat> so it did afford you a little bit more luxury but i mean it didn't uh, you didn't do much you still you still had to be wary of what you were doing because if yeah. you kick your toe somewhere and, and left a lot of blood then it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it was going to be talked about <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so so you needed but but um that said at the end of the day really uh i think the guys at the front of the show anyway were always sort of fairly dedicated and committed yeah. to what they're doing so there wasn't you know there'd be a bit of fun and, and this and that all around the the edges but i think the 70s um may have been the barry sheen era and really? that type of thing might have been a little bit different and then so when i got in it changed from when i got into when i left and then it would have been the same from uh, from casey to when he left 
but um, you know, went more professional. The sponsors changed the way that everything wanted to be perceived and and whatever else. Whereas it was still pretty much when I got in in '89 to the World Championship thing, it was still um, it was it was fairly basic. Although it was a big show, the bigger bigger than anything I'd ever seen before, and only Formula One, which was something similar. But you know, Sunday night there'd always be. a party in somebody's motor home everyone together and and having a bit of a laugh and and there was a bit more sort of social aspect to it but as as the years went on it was just in and out of the races and there was yeah. none, none of this and and then likewise today there's um you go to the paddock and there's you don't really see anyone any longer but it was like that almost at the end of my yeah right you know riders would go from the motor homes or the hospitality straight to the so yeah. there was less mingling around and, and whatever else and it's just I think the sport just evolves and as you say the social media side of things and the just the instant access to yeah. everything at the moment's changed the dynamics of the whole sport but but uh, living in and around Monaco you know I moved straight to Monaco when I uh, when I went to Europe and um so really it didn't, uh, you know, I just thought it was an old person's retirement village when we first got there but it was fairly uh, fairly uh <laughs> Uh, fairly centrally located which was perfect and uh, so we'd, I was driving a lot of the places back then and a lot of the races and so on and come back there and had the motorhome so but you'd meet the there were a lot of other uh, races and sports people and met some ex um, or some business types from Australia and so on so you'd meet a few different people there but again I wasn't really thinking about who they are what they're doing yeah. it's just you know I'm doing my own thing yeah. and uh, you just you get to meet a few people along the way but but certainly I've been blown away by some of the people as I'm sure a lot of others have but um, you know you meet people that uh, wow Jesus I, you know such and such and I'm just met with him and the, so sport opens a lot of doors in all aspects of life and uh, yeah because everyone loves sport, it breaks down the it breaks down demographics big time. So um, so a lot of people who I'd want to meet want to meet me, and and, yeah. and vice versa, or you know, and especially and, and even today, you know, because a lot of people who are young are now in in positions and they remember the sports back in those days. So if anything, sometimes it's easier to open a door now than than it was. 20 years ago. Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense. It's one thing that always blows me away with the podcast is like the people that listen to this are people i would like love to meet mm. and love to hang out with and like i'm fans of them but you're, you're doing something that's like covering a sport that or like in and around a sport that they love and it, it instantly just chops down mm. all of the of the in between or like the status gap or whatever mm. the mm. perceived status mm. gap that you would have um and it, it, it comes through like that no, sport absolutely. you know absolutely yeah um so how, how much time you got have you got a battle um soon? yeah well, you know how much more do you need i got a couple questions you, yeah, i got not. i got a couple uh from phone's been going fucking off it's yeah head. i know <laughs> <laughs> uh these are from casey oh yeah so i feel like a bit ass these ones <laughs> what uh did you have a different strategy for racing the europeans versus racing the westerners no not at all uh, at the end of the day i was racing myself um and i had to do the best job i could and if i did that as good as i could nobody else would come close to me so so that was always my game um and the you know the americans were um it was the australians and the americans really in the late 80s early 90s and mm. um so there was a few uh europeans that they they were struggling they were good in the lower categories of 125 and 250 but whether or not that the dirt bike background was helping with the um, with the 500s in those days uh, made the difference, but um, well, there wasn't that many Europeans that I was racing with anyway. But the odd Japanese occasionally, but um, but so it was more about competing. You could always pushing yourself to to be better. So that was really just uh, it was more about. I always felt that I was was quicker than any anybody else, regardless who they are. But then I had to actually do that on the racetrack. So so that's where I'm saying, like beating myself, mm. just pushing myself to to be um, to be better than everybody else. And I I knew if I pushed myself to the limit all the time, <laughs> then uh, then the rest would take care of the itself. rest would take care of itself. And these guys would have to try and catch me. So uh, to talk about the bikes again so that 500 era like i think for you to, to do what you did just ridiculous like five five on the trot 
on some of the gnarliest machines that will probably ever get ridden. No electronics, like crazy power that, you know, there's, I've listened to some stuff where you say that right before braking, the thing would just like pick up the front wheel and it like it was a real they were a real animal to to ride how the fuck do you ride one in the wet yeah uh towards the end there they did have a couple of settings that you'd you'd uh, you'd um with just ignition uh retard the ignition and, and so on which make it a little bit doughier but <clears throat> it's just understanding the power on the bike really so the today the tires are a are, are great um suspension's great but um equally back then the tires we were running were pretty good you know nothing compared to today but i mean for what we had so so as long as you get some feel out of it it was all right you just needed to be careful with the throttle and uh, <laughs> and um and with the two stroke you always needed to keep it in the power so and especially in the wet because once the thing would spin mm. you'd never keep up with it so you needed to use the clutch as well to to disengage the the the, the rear wheel otherwise the thing would just keep spinning so um yeah so the, i enjoyed the wet but uh, but it was always the 500 plus being so light mm. so the lighter it is and the more rigid it is the less feel you have so you know initially the thing uh we'll put a the the 250s production bikes road bikes that i racing in 87 were heavier than the 500s i was racing in 89 so you know, so, wow. you know with, but now you've got uh, the, the 589 probably had 170 horsepower was a, and uh, and was 100 and uh, 115 kilograms that and, is crazy <clears throat> and they um and the 250 Proddy bike was probably about 145 with about 35 horsepower. You know? Dude, that is so, insane. So, uh, and then they added some weight to it um, for 91 because uh, the 250 Cedo Pons came in in 1990 and kept crashing. He was a 250 world champion in 89. He opted on a Honda in, in 90 and um, kept crashing them all the time. So he was part of a, 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 a manufacturer type board yeah uh for the for the um to, to to work out the specifications of the bikes going forward and they added 15 kilos to the bike so they became 130 from uh from 91 Still onwards. Nothing, eh? so but uh 128 without a gas tank so they'd measure yeah. them without a gas tank so the gas tanks were 30 liters of fuel yeah so um but um but that become more difficult then to stop the, the, again the side angle yeah. the, the, the side grip was worse because again now i got more weight wanting to go that way and so it took a while for things to actually go quicker than they were in 1990 yeah yeah but um but yeah the um the the rigidity of the bikes is they're really rigid and um because it's it's built to just like a formula one car they said there's a moto gp bike it's built just for the racetrack it's not a super bike yeah. which was intended to be a street bike and give you plenty of feedback and whatever else so you've just got no feel and then the lighter it is there's no feel as well so so that's the, when i was saying earlier about understanding the 500 it's a completely different concept and nothing that yeah. i'd ever ridden before it, whereas all of a sudden you just can't feel anything underneath you you know it doesn't want to turn you know because it's just uh, it just doesn't do anything what a typical bike was doing so you've got to sort of work out different uh, ways of, of getting on top of it and then equally a bit bit with the wet so you need to get that feedback of yeah uh, of, and that sort of comes with a bit of experience and then uh, and then also uh, just a lot of good guessing <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then uh, and um and having having good guys around you to understand the the the, the suspension settings and and uh, power settings so uh, it's uh, but 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 the 500 very very uh, very very good fun bike to ride once you understand it <laughs> and how hard was it to convince honda to make it slower for you because it was 96 it was pretty wild and then 97 they slowed it down a little bit for you and then the the bike actually got better as they slowed it down was that like a hard conversation to have with honda or were they pretty on board um the, yeah well the engineering side of the, the engineers just want to engineer and build stuff you yeah know, and, and for for hrc back in that point in time and probably still the same they're all young engineers so before they put them in the real world at r d they make all their mistakes at the racetrack they can get away with this type of thing so 
So they're all young engineers. <laughs> they're just keen. And they're keen and they change them out. Honda change them out every three years. So, yeah, right. You know, so there's... While I was there, I actually was able to, to convince them to keep a couple of key guys because... Yeah. You know, at some point in time, some year from year to year, the bike could be completely different. It's like, what happened to this thing? Yeah. So, um, and it's just a new, new engineers, new ideas. So it wouldn't be an evolution. It'd just be a new bike. So, because Honda was fairly new, like to MotoGP, right? Like when uh, they, they'd been in and then they left and then they'd come oh, back. Okay, so, yeah. but I mean, they'd been around racing since since way back when. So, and then, but they came in, I think, with a four stroke. Uh, so I think '83 with uh, with Freddie Spencer, they won their first 500 cc championship. Yeah, but I think '82, okay. '81, around that the late the late '70s, they didn't. Um, I don't think they were competing. They were in the '60s and yeah. maybe early '70s, and they had success. And, um, and but then Yamaha Suzuki and the MV Augusta and all these guys, and then Honda come back in around about '80, but with a, an NR an oval piston. Uh, four stroke thing which never really worked yeah you know and there was the press nicknamed it never ready I guess it was a, <laughs> but but then they outlawed it when when they did finally get this thing going they um oh, it, was, wow. it was like a v8 but uh but only four cylinders you know it was um but so then while this thing was sort of they were still evolving this thing they started with the three cylinder t- uh, two stroke and and you know honda honda near honda as it uh um, engineering companies where you see even well they won the formula one championship last year yeah you know i think mercedes and uh, and honda are probably the two best uh, uh technologically speaking companies out there so when they put their mind to something it's quite yeah, good they and make even, it happen and even two stroke the two stroke technology that they had and also the carburation system that they had everything was was perfect but um <clears throat> but but yeah honda went and they stayed and they've stayed uh, since 83 to today and i think if if Honda were to pull out, Yamaha would pull out, and then everyone else would pull out. But um, yeah, you know, I think that uh, I think before the old man Honda died, I think that was the thing. You know, racing's part of his blood, yeah. and then um, so we're gonna we're gonna stay racing. So you know, so hopefully, hopefully uh, Honda stay in there for a while because I think they're the backbone to the sport at the moment. Yeah, yeah, that no, makes sense. Well, uh, I'll let you go. I appreciate you. Uh, <laughs> appreciate your time. We'll do a part two in another twelve yeah, months. Yeah, we'll, no worries. Uh, get, get you back in. We'll we'll get our three hours. We'll just get it over like three years. <laughs> no <worries. laughs> that sounds good. Thanks, no, I appreciate mate. that. Cheers. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. And to listen to the full three-hour podcast, search Gypsy Tales in your favorite podcast platform or click the link in the description below. Gypsy gang.